So if you have some questions and you'd like to put them in the Q&A box, we'd appreciate it. There are two questions already, and I think they're both for you, Anthony. And the first one is, can you um, tell us what source of manure? Yes, at, uh, at, at Beersford, it was uh, a manure feedlot scraped off an apron. Uh, kind of a daily scrape, if you will. It would it would lay there uh, for a few days, and then and then they'd scrape it. Um, and at, at at Brookings, the source was a dairy um, a dairy manure uh, held in a lagoon from a from a milking parlor in a stanchion bar. Okay. And the next question from Glenn is: um, How was the manure applied each time? Was the surface applied followed by tillage? Or well, we had a variety of approaches. In the beginning, um, um, seven or eight years, the manure was hand applied. We weighed it by hand and applied it by hand. I, I referred to a picture there early in the presentation. It showed uh, the Beersford plots with, with two different rates. And so we hand applied that. And then we, um, we did incorporate that with tillage uh, within a day. Uh, after that. And then uh, there was kind of a switch in philosophies in that time period where we we just left it on the surface and um, uh, no-till was becoming very popular and so we we can we left it on the surface and I I failed to include that in the presentation today and I apologize for that but it, it just kind of muddles the water a little bit but but I think the effect on soil test and the soil properties is is uh, stands by itself, and it, it's clear that it, it has an impact. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Rick Kelch is asking, is your research published? And if it is, can you sh share that research or reference? Yes. Um, uh, what Dr. Kumar did with his student, Ekram, is he came in and he measured soil properties um, at a certain point in time, and that uh, that data has been published, and I can link link you to Dr. Kumar for that. Uh, the annual measurements that we took from 2003 to 2014 uh, were not published in a journal, but they were published in our soil water reports every year. And uh, uh, they may or may not be in your library on campus. Uh, we tried to send a copy of our soil and water progress reports to the well, most of the land grant universities, and and uh, so um, contact me, and I can help. I can help get a, get you in contact with that. Okay. The next question is from Jean Marie, and I think this is probably for you, Anthony, and Sig. And the question is: Is there any good way to use manure to improve recently developed housing areas, or is it just to? She says stinky. I'll say smelly. To be <laughs> to be practical for that sort of location. You want me to go first? I, I would think the compost is a great option for that. Uh, that, to me, in my experience, takes that stinkiness out, and uh, it's a lot more safer to haul and handle and and, and deal with. Uh, that that would be my recommendation. So I second that, Anthony. That's that's you know, compost is a safe way to transport it. It makes it already stable and uh, it's, it's going to be a much safer bet. Okay. The next question is from Felix, and he's asking, have you looked at digesting the manures first as a strategy to lower GHG release, and what effects would that be on the nutrients? Uh, no, we have not tried that. We don't have a digester in our facilities in the Ag Experiment Station. Um, I know that's uh, a strong possibility, and, and probably Dr. Snap could add a lot to that. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's something I haven't had experience with either. But, uh, you know, any way we can reduce greenhouse gases and okay. capture them for good, I think it's a win-win. So definitely one of the future directions. It's been used for hundreds of years in other parts of the world. So we just need to get, um, you know, improve our, our technologies and, and uh, really start tip up our game on that, in my view. So um, I can add to, to, to a summary, a little bit of a summary of those greenhouse gases. 
Um, with the plots where we overapplied manure, like in the two nitrogen rate manure treatment, uh, methane was was the, the problem gas. And then the high fertility treatment, nitrous oxide was the problem gas. So so there's 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 issues with both sides, with both sources, and 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 we just gotta use best management practices to to reduce that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mario was asking, did you test for NO3 and P leaching? P phosphorus leaching, I think that's probably for you, Anthony. Um, no, we did not. Uh, we, we measured uh, nitrate nitrogen to the two foot depth. And, and um, um, in South Dakota, I was trained that leaching here meant beyond the root zone. And so uh, we would have needed to go beyond, beyond uh, probably four feet to take measurements below that to look for nitrate nitrogen. And um, uh, we did not do that. And, and we also did not look for the phosphorus leaching either. This, this was basically a non-funded project um, for, uh, it was funded the first two years, but then after that we, we saw the importance of keeping it going as a really good teaching and demo tool. And, and so we, we actually stole funds from other projects to keep that going. All right, thank you. Les is asking, um, why is the big jump? Sorry, could I, could I, sorry, I didn't, I hadn't unmuted. Uh, if I can come in, I just like to say that uh, we, we did look at, at leaching. We had some lysimeters in that, that living field lab, long-term trial in Southwest Michigan. And uh, we were really excited to see, of course that was composted manure that was put on, but we definitely saw very low nitrous oxide losses and very low nitrate leaching. We didn't look at phosphorus. Um, as long as you had a good crop growing after and following the practice of applying on uh, to cover crops or to weeds, uh, to something growing, then I think that, that you can really see that tied up in organic matter and uh, really minimal as long as you're also keeping within, you know, we were doing only two tons per acre. So modest amounts um, Less than the demand of the crop. So I think and we also adjusted fertilizers by uh, In terms of a credit um, We did find one time we did do an experiment where we different fertilizer levels and really high levels above recommended at 200 pounds per acre which and also we had the manure there in under corn and we found nitrous oxide really started to go through the roof as soon as you get above about 120. Once you get above the, what the crop demand is, you can get unexpected problems. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Anthony, Les is asking why was the big jump in the last two to three years and several parameters in your studies? Uh, the big jump. Yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of we see that a lot of times with manured fields, the variability in soil test levels. And I I referring to soil test levels, the phosphorus levels. I, I hope so, because that's what I'm gonna address. But um we see that issue. Um and it's the probably the variability of of the application and and the sampling. And we, we tried to take the same number of cores per plot each year. And uh, we do know uh, that uh, those manured fields take a lot more cores to get a lot better representation of those values. So we see that up and down uh, nature, especially in those manured fields. Okay, thank you. Rick is asking, what is your experience with formation of soil aggregates with use of manure? How quickly do aggregates form, and do these aggregates last beyond the cropping season in which manure is applied? That's Dr. Snap, right? <laughs> well, I, I'm happy to jump in because we just published a paper in Soil Science Society of America, my student Placid and Pecatula, and uh, I and, and I'll, I'll add that to the chat. So I was just looking for that. So in fact, uh, we saw that any of the composted treatments, um, but particularly if the cover crop was there as well, we saw very stable aggregates, particularly the micro aggregates were stable to chisel plowing in any case. So we really feel that's an early indicator of carbon sequestration or organic matter formation is uh, aggregates tell you before the total organic matter because remember it's really hard to measure organic matter because of differences in bulk density. We always recommend you uh, measure, you, you take soil samples, particularly in a quiescent or quiet time of year, like the fall after harvest, um, 
sometimes if you're trying to measure nitrogen release, you would do it in the spring, but generally in the fall, if you're trying to look at long-term changes like aggregates and soil organic matter, because otherwise, if the soil's just been fluffed up and uh, tilled or uh, even just planting, you, you're, you're actually sampling from a different volume of soil than if you sample um, when the soils become more compacted just due to the season as it unfolds and depending on practices. So we have to be really careful that we're sampling the same soil volume depth each year. And otherwise you get these fluctuations, apparent fluctuations, because you're sampling more topsoil or less depending on how fluffy the soil is. So um, aggregates, yes, they can stabilize if you have particularly two manure or compost plus cover crops, I think you can say. Thank you. Kelly is asking us, and I think this is probably for you, Anthony, were losses to groundwater considered or monitored in your studies? No, they were not. Okay. okay. Dean is asking, are you, are you aware of studies where soil health was considered by mycorrhizal fungi measurements when applying manure versus synthetic amendments? Dr. Sandeep Kumars has, has published some papers that way, I believe. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, he would probably not be the first author, his, his students would be. And so uh, um, if, if you want me to pursue that, I, I, can, I can be the my, intermediate between him and, and yourself, if need to be. Sig, are you aware of any studies where mycorrhizal fungi measurements are, no, are being looked at when applying manure versus synthetic? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm on the side of thinking those aren't very helpful measurements, so I'm sorry, I don't know. Okay. All right. Anthony, Eric is asking, when you apply manure without incorporation, did you quantify ammonia volatilization at all? No, we did not. Uh, the beef feed, I didn't show any values for, for the inorganic nitrogen in those uh, manure sources. The beef feedlot manure had very little, um, very little. It was mostly all organic nitrogen uh, there. Uh, the, of course, the dairy manure had some, had some in it, um, but we did, we did not quantify that. Right. Thank you. 